myself and I have no food in my refrigerator? Is God glorified when we are in sorrow? How can he be glorified? See, victory over sin should be something that glorifies God, shouldn't it? Because that's what we had before sin. We had glory to God. Our relationship was based on our reverence of God. So we should be, the Bible says, come boldly to the throne of grace. So when you come boldly to the throne of grace and we put our, make our petitions known, we should be by faith believing that what we have just spoken shall come to pass. And when we do that, then we have what we call the Day of Atonement. Now, the Day of Atonement meant that once a year, the priest will go into the inner court. And what would he do when he went in? Now, he would only do this once a year. He would transfer the blood that was at the altar. Uh, he would take it into the most holy place. And he would sprinkle the blood onto an instrument that was in the most holy place. We'll get to that in a second. What was the instrument? What was the only piece of furniture that was in the most holy place? It was the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was an instrument. It was the, uh, it looked like a chest. <coughs> what was inside the Ark of the Covenant? There was three things in the, in, the, in the Ark of the Covenant. One was what? The table of the Ten Commandments. One was Aaron's rod that budded. And what's the third thing? The heir of man. Each one of these things represents Jesus and the, the plan of salvation. The first thing is the Aaron of Manna. The Aaron of Manna, uh, which is what God fed the children of Israel when they were wandering around in the wilderness and decided that, well, we're hungry. Why would God bring us out here and not feed us? So their faith was tested. And when their faith was tested, God instructed them that they would have manna to eat. And to specify that this manna was provided by God, in the Ark of the Covenant, they were to remember that God did provide. Amen. What's Jehovah Jireh mean? God is our provider. You know, in this church, I, I found out that, that we have a, a, a food ministry in this church. And there is run by Don and Lynn. And every month, I understand, we feed about 500 people in this church. The smaller churches this year, we can feed 500 people a month in this church. That's amazing. And one day I was here, I don't know if any of you have volunteered or helped with the food pantry. One day I came. And they run that like a machine. I mean, they have the food, they have the, the everything is packed up. I mean, the way they run that food pantry is, 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 is something. If you ever had time, come here every other Friday when they do that and you witness the glory of God, how they run that food pantry. Don, y'all do a fantastic job in that food pantry. And then, they really do. They really do. Well, God is our provider. And that's what that, that, that signifies. Believe that he will provide. I've personally been in situations where I didn't know how we were going to eat. I really didn't. We just prayed and went about our father's business, but my children don't look like they've gone without eating, do they? <laughs> we, we, he, he provides. Now, what's the next thing that was in the altar? It was the, the rod of Aaron. And Aaron's rod but Now some of y'all might be mad at me. But I'll tell you something. The significance of Aaron's rod but What does that mean? What did that mean? What did that signify? It signifies spiritual authority. Who should be choosing who? If this is God's work. If this is done by the power of the Holy Spirit, then who should be selected who should be up here preaching? 
God should. Sometimes we make choices that are not God's choices. Sometimes we make choices we don't even ask God. That is disobedience. That is disobedience. And disobedience does what to the sanctuary? It defiles it. So if you have an important decision to make, do you ask God? Do you get on your knees and pray and say, Lord, you guide me? What did Chuck call it? The designated driver. Some of us make decisions and say, well, Lord, Lord let me, I can handle this one. Let me, let me drive. And God says, okay. What's that old saying in the commercial? You'll see me now or you'll see me later? <laughs> Who should be the designated driver? They was in a situation with the children of Israel where they said, well, you know, who, who should be in charge here? And what did God tell them to do? He said, take a staff from each of the tribe of the children of Israel. Bring it here. Lay it down here. What happened when they came back the next day? Here is Rod Buddy. Not only did it bud, but what else did it do? It produced almonds in one night. So God made it clear who he chose. Yes. So if you ask him, won't he make it clear to you? Yes. We're talking about relationship. If you know God, and you have a relationship with him, and you ask him, why wouldn't he tell you? It is important for everything in the church to be decent and order. For the sanctuary to glorify God. The only way we do that is with his instructions. It's to ask him. And then the third thing that was in the Ark of the Covenant was the Ten Commandments. Now I'm going to tell you something else. When we're talking about the table of the Ten Commandments, and we know that spiritually, it's really only one commandment. What I said earlier, love thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind, and love thy neighbor as thyself. <clears throat> So when we're talking about the Ten Commandments, it's one principle. If you obey all of it, or you don't obey the principle of any of it. So when people think, well, if I can just obey three, four, five, ten, if I can get not eight of them, that, that's close enough, isn't it? Eighty percent, that's still a B. <laughs> but does the commandments work that way? No. You obey all of it, or you are disobedient by principle to all of it. Because remember, how many sins does it take to defile the sanctuary? It only takes one. So 99% won't work. Do you want to be in heaven 99%? What does that mean if you, you, you almost got there? You was, you was 99% from going to heaven. You, you, you didn't make it. And we're not here to be 99%. You don't want 99% of God. He don't want 99% of you. Because that won't work. We have to have all of it. So we have to obey all of it. In principle, I've heard people at altars, even within our own church, that put so much emphasis on one commandment, we act like the rest of them don't exist. Is that of God? No. That's presumption. That's what God presumptuous speaking. We have to embrace all of His commandments. And when we do that, and on the cover of the Ark of the Covenant, what was on the cover? It was the mercy seat. What was on both sides of the mercy seat? The cherubs. And I want you to notice something in the Bible. That the cherubims were facing each other. They're facing the mercy seat. And their wings were pointed up. What does that signify? What does that signify? When the wings are facing upward and they're pointing towards the mercy seat. The mercy seat of God is the throne of grace. And the wings being pointed upward, wings specified in one instance in the period of prophecy, speed, and the other one is wisdom. Our wisdom comes from where? From God the Father. Everything that we do in the church to bring people home, because this is our home. 
It's in honor of God the Father. When we talk about the day of judgment, the day of atonement, the cleansing of the sanctuary, because it was defiled by sin, what is the cleansing of the sanctuary? What is the investigative judgment? What's being judged? Is your sin being judged? No. You're not being judged. It's the character of God in you that's being judged. In Sabbath school today, it was a reference made there. When the people reflect the character of God, when we as a people, as a generation, by the character of God, reflect the true victory over sin, which is our propensity to sin. Not just simply the sin itself, but the condition of sin. When we overcome the condition of sin by the blood of the Lamb, then we reflect the character of God, and once that happens, his name is vindicated, and this is over. Amen. What is stopping you now from reflecting the true character of God? This comes down to just two things. To know Him and to love Him. Amen. The more you know Him, the more you love Him. The more easy it is to obey Him. See, when you're young and you, 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 you see one of my children, it's easy for them to be obedient to their parents because they love us. They don't obey us because they think we're right. They obey us because they love us. This is what God is asking us to do. You don't have to worry about trying to prove to someone that this is correct. We can just love them into this being correct. We can right now decide to show the true character of God by not allowing sin to reign in our bodies. Because remember, the sanctuary is inside here, in your heart. Amen. You're the sanctuary. You're the church. He's not coming back for this building. He's not coming back for this denomination. He's coming back for you and I. And when he comes, Will he find any faith? When he comes, when he mention your name, will he see his face in you? Will he see his character in you? Will he see victory over sin in you? Will he see a victory over the propensities, the very condition of sin in you? That's what's being judged. That's what the cleansing of the sanctuary is. It's our spiritual life song. That's what it is. By the power of the Holy Spirit, you can do it. Because it's just a decision. Another one thing that Chuck always talks about when he talks about the designated driver, I love that, is that when it's a designated driver, why are we so worried about where we're going? Why are we always concerned about the stop signs and the stop lights. And if you're not driving, you ever see somebody in the back seat that making yelling instructions from the back seat? They do. They think they know more than, than you know, and you're driving. You know, but they can see something you don't see. Oh, did you see that? Did you see this? I mean, you're, he's in the front seat. He should see it. But some of us do that. But we do this spiritually. Because we get in situations where we say, God, I know what your word says, but, you know, I really, I, I think I see something maybe you, in, you overlooked. And we want to drive. Why would God teach us to drive if he's not going to let us drive? Isn't he ever thought about that? Why would he teach us to drive and then say, I don't want you to drive? Because we got to know what is literal and what is spiritual. Because spiritually, God has never said for you to drive. Never said. There's no scripture that says you should be driving. None. That's why we messed up with Lucifer when he decided he wanted to drive. So when we talk about the sanctuary as a whole, 
I could have gotten more into the uh, uh, investigative judgment and what happened in 1944. But I wanted to just give you a foundation that the whole church, our whole being here on this earth about the battle between good and evil, it comes down to the sanctuary. Our relationship with God was defiled by sin. It is still defiled by sin. And the only way to overcome it is through the blood of the Lamb. And the only way, the only way, is through a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, then everything I say is just a story. Our goal here, and I'll end with this, in the book of Matthew, in chapter 28, in verse 19, the Bible says to go out into the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things that I have taught you. And lo, I shall be with you always, even to the end of the earth. We had three people that were baptized today. And we have given them the right hand of fellowship in this church. And we have sent them on their way to their life spiritually with Christ. But it would be doing a disservice. A disservice. If they're the only ones in here that understand the sanctuary. If they're the only ones in here that understand that the whole purpose of this, the whole point is to bring them to the throne of grace. That they can use that as the pattern to their lives that direct everything that they do. But that same advice plan, scripture, is for all of us. If we do that, then we hasten his second coming. If we do that, then you can give a Bible study to anyone. If we do that, then we can be about our Father's business. See, you don't have to be a scholar. You don't have to memorize every scripture. Just have a relationship. Just give your testimony and your word. And we can bring people to Christ. That's what the Advent movement is about. This is the principles of our faith. To bring them in with love, with clarity, and, and our thoughts and prayers are always in the hope of glory. Can we do that? Amen. I close the song is four ninety nine.
Thank you, Lord, for all that you have done. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the sanctuary. A place where we have learned is our refuge, is our rock, is our fortress. It is our time of trouble that shall be eased. Father, I pray that those that have a need for your grace and your mercy and your healing shall leave this day a little more comfortable. Those that were in need of just being loved by you shall feel your loving arms around them and know that they are not alone, that you are with them, and that you always be with them. Let us leave from this place, but never from your presence. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen.